Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Sheep Blowfly Update, Insecticide Resistance. My name is Jodie Rizé, and I'm part of the Sheep Connect SA team. Our speaker today is Narell Sales. Narell is a research officer at the Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute, and has worked predominantly on insecticide resistance of the Australian sheep blue fly and the sheep biting louse at New South Wales Department of Primary Industries since the 1980s. Narell is currently undertaking resistance testing of the sheep blue fly, which is jointly funded by Australian Blue Innovation. Thanks, Narell. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, and I'd like to thank Sheep Connect SA for inviting me to talk with you tonight about fly strike and insecticide resistance in the Australian sheep blowfly Lucilia caprina. Our lab at New South Wales DPI has been looking for and detecting resistance in Lucilia since the 1950s when organochlorines were used. Periodically, we ask producers to submit maggots collected off struck sheep and determine their insecticide resistance profiles. We currently have a jointly funded project with Australian Wool Innovations um, to do just that. Here you can see photos on the left of maggots in culture and the cages that we keep them in. When we receive um, strains from the field, uh, there's probably 60 to 100 um, flies, which would be in the small cage on the left hand side and we have to breed them up sufficiently to test. So that takes um, two generations, uh, which we do. So why do we test in the lab rather than testing straight on sheep in the field, which we also do, but um, predominantly we do it in the laboratory. We do it because we can control the variables that you see on the left-hand side um, that you would find out in the field, temperature, humidity, wind speed, rainfall, sheep, we don't, we rule out things like sheep comp conformation and fleece composition. We give them unlimited food and water so um, they're not restricted in any way. Uh, we, when we breed them, we get rid of all of the variability of their life cycle so that they are all timed perfectly. And we can deliver treatment doses and applications that are highly, um, they're highly precise and repeatable. That we also rule out the interaction of other chemicals such as drenches and lice treatments. So this, we use different, a variety of different um, procedures depending on the mode of action of the insecticides that we're looking at. This photo on the left is Blake, who works in the laboratory at the moment. And you can, he's um, putting newly hatched maggots onto insecticide treated replicants at a very, over a range of different concentrations. And from that, we um, are able to determine the resistance profile to that chemical. Um, depending on the insecticide, those maggots are either counted after 24 or 48 hours exposure. We do this because we have a, a range of reference strains, strains that we know have individual resistances. And when we compare, we can, th can then compare the strains that are submitted by producers with these reference strains. So we can um, categorise accur accurately the strains that are submitted. For the insecticide ceromazin and dicyclinol, these are both insect growth regulators or IGRs, and we have to use a different test. The previous tests were thing for insecticides that kill very quickly um, and or cause paralysis, whereas for ceromazin and dicyclinol, which are the actives from um, products like Vetrazin and Click, we actually have to incorporate the insecticide into the feeding media and the maggots are exposed to it from the time that they hatch right through um, their in, till they grow full size and um, move off the feed to pupate. And then we count the number of adults that actually emerge from those pupae. Um, IGRs interfere with that whole process of, of mag maggots are like a snake and they have to change their skin to grow bigger. And these insecticides actually um, stop that um, process. 
So that's why we need to look at these. And, and this takes about three weeks for us to get the um, results from this assay. So we often get asked um, regarding insecticide resistance, have things changed? So some background to insecticide resistance, as I said, um, insecticides have been used for a very long time. And you can see there that um, the arsenics were used as early as 1919. Um, and then there was a whole range of different um, inorganics like the magnesium fluorosilicate. Um, and then in the late 40s and um, early 50s, organochlorines, that's Aldrin, Aldrin Dildrin, Lindane, um, these became very popular. And they were a bit notorious because apparently you could put it on one end of the sheep and it would travel all the way to the other end of the sheep. So um, they were taken up with great gusto, I believe. And, but unfortunately, as you can see there, res resistance was detected within three years of the use of these organochlorines. When the organophosphates came out in the later 1950s, there was a lot of... Um, concern at the very beginning because uh, they producers didn't think that they worked very well but it was because um, they had to be applied thoroughly over the animal there was no longer there, there wasn't the same um, movement as there was with the organochlorines um, and they took about eight years until resistance developed you can see at the very bottom there benzophenol ureas um, that's also igrs like diflubenzeron and triflumeron they were introduced in 93 and that again, within eight years, there was resistance um, to that group of chemicals. The best one to date is um, butacarb, uh, which is carbonate, which actually less, uh, it lasted less than a year. So um, the currently registered chemicals, uh, you can see there a list. Um, there's ceromazin, which is the IGR we just talked about. Uh, an example of that is vetrazin. That took approximately 32 years before resistance was detected, which is an incredibly long time for any insecticide against any insect, really. Um, synthetic pyrethroid, cypermethrin, is, um, is uh, registered in a product called Vanquish, and that was introduced in 88. We also have ivermectins, which are MLs, um, products such as blowfly and lice, jetting fluids, um, that was introduced in um, the early 90s. Dicyclinol, the active in products like Click, that came out in 98. And resistance was also detected in 2011 in that same survey um, and is thought to be a cross resistance. However, we started this um, project that, that we have running at the moment in late 2017, and we pretty quickly um, determined that dicyclinol. Uh, things had changed with dicyclinol since that um, 2011 um, to about 13 or 14 survey that was done. Um, it appeared to uh, be a, of higher level resistance and also was far more widespread. Um, it's more so in New South Wales than anywhere else. Uh, after that is um, spinosad, which is the active in chemicals like extinosad, which is the one which is the aerosol can that you can spray on, and it also comes in a jetting fluid. That was introduced in 2003, and the the most recent um, one to be to get a claim for blowfly is imidacloprid, which is a, which you may know as Avenge for lice control, the blue one online. Um, which now has a blowfly claim and it's a Venge plus blowfly and that's just recently been released. So what fly strike preventative products are available and in real terms, how many weeks protection, um, up to how many weeks protection are you likely to get from these chemicals based on the label claims? Well, the synthetic pyrethroid, cypermethrin, vanquish, um, 10 weeks, to date, there's no resistance detected in Australia. It's a spray on. Um, vetrazin um, becomes in both a jetting fluid with 14 weeks protection or a spray on 11 weeks. But as I just said, that there has been resistance detected to this um, and it's been described as low level resistance. 
Dicyclinol, the active in products like the Click Range, which are spray-ons, um, and we can go from 11 weeks for the lower concentration spray-on to 29 weeks with Click Extra. Um, there has been um, resistance detected to Dicyclinol, as I've already mentioned. Um, the ivermectin um, jetting fluid will give you up to 12 weeks protection, but on the label it does say that's for low to medium fly pressure. Um, Avenge plus Blowfly uh, is a spray on 14 weeks. Um, and the Extinosad Eliminator, which is the jetting fluid, um, will give you four to six weeks protection against fly strike. Uh, there are also um, OPs that are still registered and can be used as dressings. So what is the situation in South Australia? Um, unfortunately, we've only received 14 samples from um, South Australia to date. Um, if you just have a look on the left hand side, you can see that strains that are susceptible to both dicyclinol and ceromazin, that's the actives in um, chemicals like um, Vetrazin and Click um, are green. So you can see that there are a fair few green, um, green uh, strains there. There's two on King Isle, uh, Kangaroo Island and two on the mainland. Ceromazin resi resistance to just ceromazin is yellow and you can see there's one on Kangaroo Island and one up near Port Augusta. Um, Strains that are both dicyclinol and ceromazin resistance. You can see there's two there um, on the mainland. Um, and purple are just four recent submissions that we've received that we've got in culture and we haven't yet tested. Um, so given that in the earlier survey that was completed in 2014, um, resistance was not... Um, found in uh, South Australia to these chemicals, should producers be rotating um, between insecticide groups? Before we get to the question of rotating, let's just run through what's considered at this moment as best practice. Um, so you really do need to know what group of insecticide the product that you've bought um, belongs to. Um, not just the product name. Um, it, if you've got two chemicals and they're, um, you know, just a different uh, manufacturer and a different product name, um, swapping from one to the other, that's not rotating amongst groups. You really need to, to look at what the active is, know what group that belongs to, and then rotate to a, a different group. Um, so, yes, we should be rotating insecticide groups when you treat where it's practical. Sometimes it's not practical, but if it is practical to do that, it's very good practice. So plan to minimize the number of treatments applied in a season, if you can, by planning. Um, and if you do have to treat twice in a season, definitely rotate to a different group. Always consider the treatments that you use for worms and lice, because sometimes the actives in those actually will be the same active that you're going to apply for blow fly, for blow, uh, fly strike. And always remember if there's a chemical on the back uh, of a sheep to control lice, if the season's right and blowflies are there, they too will in, come in contact with that um, chemical. Um, they're not discrete things, there will be overlap. So you must always apply your insecticides carefully and strictly according to the label. And don't, overdosing is as bad as underdosing in many ways when it comes to resistance. Overdosing will rapidly select for resistance. During the peak fly strike um, time for your property, you need to monitor fly, for fly strike very frequently, um, every second day um, in the peak of the season. And I know this is often hard because there's other activities going on. But um, if you if you are at, if there is a risk, um, it, it, you need every second day because forty eight hours is a long time in the life of a maggot. When cleaning up strikes, always collect and kill the maggots. 
because if you don't and those maggots drop to the ground and then they pupate there are the next um, generation of flies that are going to come and strike your um, sheep reduce rely overall we need to reduce the reliance on insecticides if we can reduce the reliance on insecticides this will slow down the development of resistance so how do you reduce the reliance on insecticides? It's very easy for me to sit here and say that that's what should happen. But how, how is that um, practicable? How can we do that? Well, um, everybody's been doing a great job of breeding sheep, which are um, more moving towards or are already um, resistant to fly strike. Use shearing and crutching because that'll give you about six weeks protection against fly strikes. So, so use that time wisely. Use, the, use that interval that it gives you, that respite, um, and use that as part of your fly strike strategy. If you dock the tails of um, sheep to the correct length, this will keep the breach much, much cleaner um, and will be less of a problem. Um, Manage scouring effectively by strategic drenching. You already do do strategic drenching. You've probably already got a drench plan and you're probably already rotating drenches. So this, for blowflies, it's ex sort of very similar, but you need to be able to mesh that rotation plan and strategic drenching in with um, your blowfly plan. Use breach modification if you need to until you get um, sheep genetically where you want them to be as far as being resistant to fly strike. So overall, drench, crutch and shear strategically, and it needs to be part of this integrated plan. So how do you crutch and shear strategically and what else do you need to do? Well, using that, examples of using that six week protection period for crutching or shearing, um, you could do it at the start of the fly season and then use a shorter acting insecticide, which might give you the protection you need to get over that danger period. So if you, if you either crutch or shear in the middle of the fly season, you might, have to, you might have to have two different short acting treatments on either side of that um, crutching or, or shearing. And to minimise resistance, you can use crutching and shearing by removing the wool before those insecticide levels of those treatments drop down to what we call selective levels. You might know that as the tail period where um, the insecticide is below an effective um, dose, but is still high enough to be selecting those insects that come into contact with it. Um, and, and developing, and from that they may develop resistance. So of course, while you're doing all of those things, you always need to, of course, observe the wool harvesting intervals for the products used and the, and the handling intervals. Um, if you get this right, short wool may actually prevent the need for the autumn treatment, depending on what area you're in. And you really do need to know how long is the risk period on your place? Do you need one longer acting or do you need two short treatments in succession? And as I said before, if you do use two shorter treatments, make sure you rotate the group. So how do you know if there is resistance? So the classic signs are you're getting less protection than the label claim or you're having to treat multiple treated struck sheep. It's not just the odd one, there's many struck sheep. It's not just like one's missed out on a dose or is, you know, it ran a bit faster or you, know, you missed it or whatever. The most important thing really is to know when your fly strike risk period is the highest on your property and how long it actually lasts for. There's a great set of tools on the Fly Boss website and I just went into this Flyboss tool, which models for um, fly strike risk. And if you just hit on the um, map, you can go to South Australia, hit on the map. So I just hit on Kangaroo Island and it pulls up all the weather data taken from the Kingscote um, uh, weather station. And as you can see below, you can pump in whatever you want, shearing date, and that's, you know, first week, second week, third week, fourth week, middle of the month, 
crutching dates, if you have one crutching, two crutchings, whether or not you've got any form of breach modification there. And then you can put in um, chemical treatments. So you can select your treatment, what, what the active is, select the month you apply it and when you imply it, uh, applied in the, that month. And then you just hit calculate. And it brings up these great um, graphs of risk. So as you can see, the brown is breach strike. Green is body strike, and then the blue is other strike. Here we see for King Island that the period, the, the, the fly strike period virtually runs from the beginning of September, pretty much through halfway through May. So if you shear in mid-July, which is what one of the submissions um, from King Island did, which is why I selected this, you can see that's actually the risk. And so the highest risk for both breach and body is in November. If you'd look to your right, if you just add animals that have got some um, clean breach, whether that be um, breeding or, or the, um, breach modification, you can see you can reduce right down, you can reduce right down the breach component of that um, risk substantially. Then below that, below the first one, if you, you move shearing time from mid-July and move to mid-September, you can see that we, we um, virtually wipe out September, October as far as breach strikes concerned. And it also gets rid of that peak for body strike in November along with breach strike. That big peak disappears. But then if we just add a clean breach, you can see what that, do, that does. Um, it, reduces, it reduces the risk considerably of, all, uh, of breach and body strike. So now if we add in a crutching, so if we shear in mid-September and just cr crutch in February, we don't do anything else. The graph on your left is what the risk looks like. So what I should have said earlier, I apologise, is that the height of those peaks is the degree and the, um, on the x-axis is the period over which the uh, risk runs. So if we, we shear in mid-September and then we crutch in February, if we move to the graph on the right-hand side, we see that shearing in mid-September and crutching in, fe in um, February, if we then add the clean breach component, it, it's a very, very different looking um, graph, very different indeed. Um, and the risk, risk is minimised and the period is reduced on the... Um, shearing end. So I also looked for an area on, in, on the mainland in South Australia and um, near the area of Kavanagh and it brought up um, a, the weather station at Hawker. Now I apologise if there aren't any sheep at Hawker, it's um, a bit hit and miss and I just had my little pointer and I'm not 100% sure where I hit. But again, the, the, a sample near there, um, they also shore in July. So I pumped that in and that's what the, um, the graphs look like for this area. So you can see it's a pretty substantial breach strike um, with the main period being basically the highest period is risk period is January. Again, if we do the same thing and introduce the um, clean breach, we can see that we reduce that, that huge breach threat right down. If you go to the bottom left hand graph, that's if we swap over to shearing in mid-September. So you get rid of um, basically a little bit in September and October, but, the, but it, it has, absolutely does nothing for the risk in January for breach strike. It sort of tightens it up a little bit, but the risk is still as high in January. So again, add in clean breach and again, it reduces it, but January is still um, a higher risk. So let's add a single treatment. So on the left, we've got our shearing in mid-September with clean breach. If we add in a treatment six to eight weeks off shears, 
um, in mid-November. You can see how suddenly November to January, um, there is no risk at all. Um, and then if we add in crutching in February, suddenly breach um, is virtually non-existent. Um, the risk to the breach area is non-existent. Now, you, it may be different for different areas, but the feedback I've been getting from submitters is that they really don't see body strike very often. It's not considered a, a, a major problem. Um, breach is the area of, of most interest. Um, there will be the odd bit of pole strike, but not a great deal. Um, so um, you'd have to look at what that means on your property if those two other categories actually constitute um, risk on your enterprise. But of course, when we get back to this integrated um, plan for your property, it's not just all about fly strike, uh, even though you know it is for me, but it's not for you guys. So how do you fit something like this? Like we, we've just demonstrated how you can reduce the threat of, of um, and the risk of, of fly strike by strategic um, shearing, crutching, or um, treatments, but how does that fit in to the schedule for joining and then for lambing? You know, you need to have those ewes with a um, clean breach well before they're too heavily in lamb. Um, and how, how, how can this fit in to your strategic drench plan as well? Um, you'll see down the bottom left-hand corner, that's the um, address for the Fly Boss tools, which is this modelling tool, which um, Brian Horton from the University of Tasmania um, has developed. It, it's a great tool, and I can't um, can't uh, say how how fabulous it is to be able for people to be able to model and actually look at look in real real terms when their risk periods are. I know you already know when your major risk periods are, but this will give you the confidence to, to know exactly and to be able to plan around. So what is the take home message? Well, and I apologize for this font because it appears that I'm screaming at you, but I couldn't alter it. Um, in South Australia, you can slow down the development of resistance to dicycle and ceromazin. If you rotate your insecticide groups that are used and reduce your reliance on insecticides. In South Australia, you still have time to do this. Um, in New South Wales, unfortunately, every um, submission that I've had to date, of which there is 57, they are all resistant to both ceromas and, and dicyclinol. That's not the case in South Australia. We'd love to get more samples so we can flesh out and from um, further afield across South Australia um, and, and uh, have more confidence about um, those numbers because as I said, there's uh, still four pending to be tested and only 14 submitted. So um, once again, I'd just like to thank um, Sheep Connect South Australia for inviting me to do this. Um, I really do urge you to, to think about um, integrating some form of um, plan and management for fly strike along with your drench plan and, and all your other plans uh, and, and um, it, give, it gives you the opportunity to preserve both um, products that contain dicycle and ceromazin for years to come so that they're still available for the arsenal that, uh, you know, in your tool belt so that you can use them. Okay, Jake, thank you very much. Thanks, Narelle. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so you've talked about New South Wales as uh, being a bit of a hotspot. How widespread elsewhere is it? Um, or, yeah. um, so we, we've um, received, uh, samples from every state except Queensland that have sheep and we've only received three samples from Tasmania. Historically Tasmania is always susceptible and the three that we've received they are susceptible. Um, as I said the, the main ones have come from um, New South Wales. Uh, we've received 24 from Western Australia of which 25% um, are susceptible 
45% are ceromazin resistance and 30% are dicyclinal resistant. Um, Victoria, not, there's still 9% susceptibles there um, and, uh, with, um, and they still have ceromazin only resistant strains as well as Western Australia and they have um, dicyclinal and ceromazin resistance present in Victoria as well. So um, Tasmania, by virtue of being surrounded by sea, um, I think uh, so far um, they, they're, they're in great shape. They're still susceptible. I also think this has got to do with um, the length of the fly strike periods. If you have that opportunity to have uh, a good cold winter where um, they, they have to overwinter, um, it, it takes the pressure off um, insecticides for a uh, certain period of the year. Whereas in, in, in warmer areas, um, and it would be very interesting to get Queensland because um, that's, that would be the warmest uh, the area that we'd be able to collect from. Um, that winter period is very short. So selection uh, is for a large part of the year. Treatments are used for a longer period, um, uh, used um, and are expected to work for their, the full length of their period uh, of their um, protection period. Okay, thanks, Narun. Uh, just a, another couple of quick ones. Um, how do we go about getting the maggots tested, and can anyone send in samples? And if so, where to? Um, yes, so we are still taking samples. Unfortunately, the project ends on the 30th of June, um, but we will be testing right up until uh, we until the project um, virtually finishes. Um, so I'm happy to post out collection kits. You can on the um, Flyboss website. There is a thing there that tells you. Um, how to collect and send the sample in yourself. But what we've found is that that is often not as successful as if uh, the collection kit that we provide um, is used. Um, so you can contact me on norell.sales at dpi.nsw.gov.au and I'm happy to send them out. Okay, we'll make your email available on the recording. So if anyone uh, would like to follow that up, um, they, they can do so afterwards. And uh, so just like to thank uh, everybody for your time and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you. If you're interested in sterile insect techniques for sheep blowfly, you can watch our recording on the Sheep Connect SA YouTube channel.